ready to choose it.
you get? Yeah, so many you couldn't even count, huh? All right, everybody, welcome to the uh, midweek service here at Harvest Baptist Church. Good to see everybody. Man, a bunch of kids here tonight. That's fantastic. I love that. I was just talking to Dave back there. It's just uh, having a church full of kids. That's, that's a wonderful thing. Sweetest song you'll ever hear sung. So good to see everybody. Glad we're here. Got some good things for the kids tonight in Patch Club. And, uh, but we're going to sing some songs. But before we do any of that, we are going to get our missionary spotlight. And uh, today... We are going to hear from our missionary friends. Let's see where they're at. Hop on a plane as we fly all the way around the globe, all the way to Cape Town, South Africa, and our friends Nathan and Kristen Childs. Now, many of you have been praying for uh, Nathan because of the uh, uh, cancer that he has, and he's beginning to go through treatments, and today's letter uh, addresses that as he talks about that. So here's what the, what the letter has to say. It says, Dear Pastor, greetings from South Africa. Kristen and I trust that you are well and that you enjoyed a wonderful Christmas season and a great start to a new year. In many ways, we find it hard to believe that we are coming to the completion of our first term in Cape Town. Let's think about that. When we had them here, uh, they were on deputation, getting ready to go, and now uh, they're at the completion of their first term. So usually what missionaries do is they'll go what's called deputation, and they'll go around and try to gain support from churches uh, to help them uh, when they go to the country that God calls them to. Then a lot of times they'll go over for what they call a term, which is usually four years, and they'll go for four years, and then they'll come back. It's not home. Any missionary will tell you home is where God calls them over there. They'll come stateside for what's called a furlough. Now, back in the day, uh, when the missionaries like Adoniram Judson and uh, Hudson Taylor and those kind of missionaries were, you know, getting in the, in, in the ships and going across the ocean, you know, for months at an, on end and would go to lands where they'd have to, you know, go with machete to the jungle and, and just uh, do all of that kind of thing of witnessing to people, uh, they would come back on a furlough to rest, to heal, uh, you know, a lot of times when you go to a different country, uh, you get certain kind of diseases and just kind of recover from that to gain strength so that they can go back, okay, to the field. Uh, furlough, unfortunately, in the Western world today is a little bit different. A lot of times what happens on furlough, not the case with Harvest Baptist Church, but a lot of church expect a report out from the missionaries as though the missionaries report to each church. No, missionaries report to God, okay? When they come to visit our church, we're here to, uh, to encourage, to refresh, and to support them any way that we can. Uh, so that's what it's to be, is to gain strength. But unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is missionaries are more exhausted at the end of their furlough uh, than when they first came because they're, they're traveling to uh, sometimes a hundred churches, uh, you know, and sometimes they're, they're going to a Sunday morning service and it's, it's everything they can do to drive across uh, numerous hours to barely make it to the next church by Sunday night. And then they have to get in the car and drive uh, to a missions conference, you know, hours over the road. It's, it's really sometimes can be a grueling experience, but nonetheless, uh, this missionary life, God sustains them, gives them strength, and the best that we can do as a local church is when we do have missionary friends here, is just to comfort, encourage, and support them any way that we can. And we're going to do that similar to how we had Austin uh, and uh, and uh, Didi here uh, uh, calling as they're getting ready to go to the Philippines. We just had a day where we had them in, and we'll have a fellowship lunch. And, and again, it looks like it's lining up. Uh, to have a number of uh, missionaries stateside this coming year. So I'm going to try and reach out to as many as I can. If they're available to make it, I'd love to have them here uh, so we can spend some time with them. But nonetheless, this is what Brother Childs has to say. He says, we find it hard to believe that we are coming to the completion of our first term in Cape Town. These have been wonderful three years with many blessings and answers to prayer. As you know, our first term has not been without its challenges, but we praise the Lord for his sustaining grace. I am writing this morning to inform you that we are planning to return to the States for a furlough beginning in the fall of this year. We would certainly love to visit each of our supporting churches. However, 
Due to my recent battle through cancer and multiple surgeries, I will need to group our meetings regionally as much as possible to reduce our traveling and allow my body to return to full strength. I will be sending out a second email in March or April to solidify our plans and begin scheduling with our supporting churches. If we are unable to arrange a meeting due to a schedule conflict, please know that we will be happy to send a video update or set up a virtual meeting in that situation. We would certainly make visiting your church a priority on our next furlough. Please be aware that all of our current furlough plans are contingent upon my cancer treatments and post-treatment surgery being completed and going well. We are trusting the Lord to continue to give strength and healing to my body. I look forward to communicating with you again in a few months. May the Lord bless you all. Your servant for Africa, Nathan Childs. Okay, so a lot on the table there, but isn't it nice that we have a God that knows all and a God that can do all that we can just approach at any given time on his behalf. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Nathan and Kristen Childs. And Lord, we can't believe it's uh, been four years, the beginning of the furlough, or their, their first term, and they're getting ready to come stateside on furlough. And Lord, I, I thank you for the faith that he demonstrates and planning on being here in the fall of this coming year. And Lord, that obviously is hinging on his cancer treatments and his post-surgery is going well, which he is trusting in you by faith, and so are we. But Lord, uh, we are going to come to you in faith and ask that these cancer treatments would eliminate the cancer, that the surgery would go exactly as according to plan, that he would be able to heal and come stateside and, and do these regional meetings that he plans on doing, just to be uplifted and encouraged by the body of believers as he comes around. And Lord, I know that he's probably got family that wants to see him too. I know that's probably a burden of theirs. Lord, I pray that they would be able to spend time uh, with family while they are here. And uh, Lord, we just look forward to you uh, intervening and healing and doing your wondrous work. And we can't wait to give you the honor, the praise, and the glory for these things. So have your hand upon them as they continually faithfully serve you. Please prepare the doctors, the equipment, whatever it is. Just reach in and let these things be so. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll hand it over this way. All right, let's keep going here this evening. I got some January events still on the table. We are going to have some more baptisms this Sunday. I am excited. Yeah, let's keep stirring those waters. All right, three for three baptism every. We've had a baptism every Sunday this year. How about that? We can, we're going to keep saying that until we can't. Okay, I'm excited about that. That's that's what's that. Yeah, till we get, all right, 52, there we go, 52 baptisms. Um, I'll tell you, on the day that you were baptized, we had 59, okay? I don't really talk m numbers a whole lot, but it is getting kind of excited. Uh, let's see if we can break that 60 barrier, and there's an easy way to do that, is if everybody invites someone uh, here to Harvest Baptist Church, I'm sure we could break 60 very easily. So let's do that again, and it's not necessarily about anything other than inviting people to church to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but let's see if we can break 60. We got 59. Uh, that was pretty good and we can we can do that all right so invite someone uh, on out to harvest baptist church even this sunday we'll have a good time we'll be praising the lord continuing talking about getting to know god all right and we're going to have baptisms as well all right let's keep going here senior moments if you haven't signed up it is this saturday all right dale you've already done the reservation yep. all right so no that doesn't change anything is anybody in here qualified to go oh yeah all right there we go all right so it looks like everybody's covered looks like there's a good group there senior moments 2 p.m at mandy's diner and then Soul Winning Sunday on the 21st. Now, I have ordered 3,000 tracks. I don't know if they'll make it. Uh, we'll pray. You never know what the Lord can do. He can do whatever he wants. We do have an abundance of door hangers, which we will take with us. Uh, and uh, But a part of those 3,000 tracks are for next month anyways. But uh, nonetheless, there are some coming. We do have material to hand out. And we do have follow-up calls to make. So looking forward to the Lord uh, doing his wondrous work on Soul Winning Sunday, which is this Sunday. Pray for good weather. Uh, it's been nice and brisk out lately. Maybe it can warm up before then as we go out and share the gospel. And then, uh-oh, February events. We're talking about that already? Absolutely. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about is soup. Bowl Sunday. That is February 11th as we have our soup competition here at Harvest Baptist Church. And I learned something. Uh, this is the fourth one. And I've learned this. Every year what we've usually done is we've allowed the teens to judge the soup. 
But what we've learned is that the teens love cheesy potato soup. So whoever makes cheesy potato soup wins. So what we're going to do this time, everybody gets to judge. We'll put it in a little box there, and everybody gets to do a little taste. of anybody that wants to enter a soup, you can bring one and not enter it. Uh, but you can bring one and enter it in. And we do have a trophy. Uh, it stays here, but you get, you get your picture taken with it. i got to get working on the new logo for the Super Bowl trophy. And uh, you just get to celebrate that for a day. So on Super Bowl Sunday, we'll have the morning service. We'll have the soup fellowship next door, afternoon service, and we will be done for the day. That is February 11th, and then that same week is the Valentine Banquet. All right, this year it's at Kreziak's house uh, right here uh, in Bay City. What says the south side of Bay City like Kreziak's? And that's where we're at here on the south side, and it's on a Thursday, February 15th at 6 p.m. Okay, so it's an evening. Uh, we get, uh, we get, do we get the banquet room or the, yep, we get the room and the cost is 13 per person. And that is for the food. If you're going to get coffee or a pop, that's a little bit extra. Uh, but it's on Thursday evening, February 15th, 6 PM. And here's what's going to happen. We'll get a sign up sheet going out, but you pay at the restaurant. That's how that's going to work. So looking forward to a good time there for the Valentine's banquet Thursday, February 15th. Uh, we put it out there a little bit early to give everybody a chance. If you need to arrange your work schedule, Uh, that you can do so. All right, time now. We're going to sing our first hymn. So let's everybody stand together. I need to find it first. I know what the name is. I just need to find the number. And it's going to be, there it is, almost, there it is, number 457, To God Be the Glory, number 457. So help me out here as we sing it. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, for Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, Redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. On the last, here we go. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great are we. The sun, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. All right, we are here to praise the Lord. And with that, let us go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here in your name and praise you. And Lord, help us as we come together to share our prayer requests, to pray together, and also to come together under your word. Thank you so much for everyone that is able to be here today. And Lord, we pray for those that are 
not able to be here, whether it be through a situation, circumstance, or whatever it may be, just have your hand upon them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you have a prayer request, hold your hand up. Ryan has some prayer request slips for you. Uh, let's see, we got anybody? Yep, we got some over here. All right. And as you fill those out, we will get ready uh, here in just a moment to sing our next song. And I will get there in just a moment. It is. Oh, getting so close. Gee, oh, there we go. Number 157. Number 157. Go ahead and open there. It is Jesus Paid It All. We'll sing one, two, and four. One, two, four. <clears throat> I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain he, he washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all a crimson stain he washed it white as snow on the last and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. All right, if you have a prayer request complete, hold it up in the air. And if you are watching on the live stream, um, please uh, make sure you share your prayer requests in the comments if you're comfortable doing so. We will add them and have added them to the prayer bulletin. So appreciate that. All right. Good job. Hey, all right. I like this. All right.
Uh, we're going to get right in the Word here this evening, uh, right into the parables of Jesus. And uh, we need to open our Bibles, which is a good thing to do, right? Open our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 15. We're going to be in two different places, but we're going to start in Luke chapter 15 uh, tonight. And uh, we are going to start Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to start right in verse number 1. Luke 15 verse 1 is where we're talking about the parables of Jesus. And uh, this one's going to be, we're going to, over the next uh, three weeks, so this week, next week, and the week after, there's going to be a kind of a recurring theme with these parables that Jesus is teaching. And uh, we're going to start with the first one tonight. And this is one uh, that is told in two different occurrences with two different intentions uh, in regards to the context. But we're going to start with the one in Luke 15, starting in verse number one. It says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Today we're going to look at the parable of the lost sheep. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that uh, even though we're talking about sheep tonight, we can't help but remember that your eye is on the sparrow. Lord, you have your eye on each and every one of us. And Lord, I thank you that uh, through your lessons and through your word that you teach us in regards to this, that there's a two-way message. There's one that, and in regards to our care for others, but also we see your care for us. So Lord, I thank you that you care for us and that you love us and that uh, you'll come after us and you'll in no wise cast us out. So help us as we study your word tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So remember, when it comes to the parables, uh, I don't have the definition up here uh, tonight, but a parable comes from the Greek word parabole, which means to set beside. And remember, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And that's why Jesus was teaching in these parables. And it's interesting, as we see here in Luke chapter 15, uh, that we have the prime reason that Jesus is teaching in parables. Uh, but he's a little more direct in this one. This one's pretty straightforward. But we know that the parables he taught in that way was, one, because the, the Pharisees were taking his words and using them against him. And also it was a way to, to separate those uh, that were serious about learning what he has to say, having ears to hear and a heart ready to receive is what we should be. And again, it starts here in chapter 15 in this parable. It says, drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Okay, that would sound great in and of itself, right? Hey, here come the publicans and sinners that want to hear what he has to say. Oh boy, but they did not want to hear what he had to say. Again, they were looking to mince his words, to use them against him. But also, look at that next verse in verse two and verse number two. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, okay, murmured. That word murmur in chapter 15, verse two, has the idea of just a, an undertoned mumbling, okay? It almost... Uh, has like the, the, the word is a sound, like murmur, murmur, right? Undertoned grumbling. And God does not like undertoned grumbling, okay? He doesn't like grumbling in general. If you, if you want to know how God feels about grumbling, look at the book of Numbers uh, when they're grumbling and he sends down a ring of fire that consumes them all with outside the camp, okay? That is how God feels about grumbling, okay? Grumbling and complaining does not please the Lord, okay? It, it's telling God, God, you're not good enough, you're not taking care of me, and you're not, uh, you, you know, you have ruined my situation. And here we see the Pharisees murmuring for those exact reasons. God, you have sent the wrong Messiah, and you are ruining our situation. And we're going to find anything we can do to find fault. You know, that's what murmuring does too. Murmuring doesn't look for a solution. Murmuring looks to find fault, okay? Uh, you've heard me say it before. There's some people that have a, pro a solution for every problem, and there are others who have a problem for every solution. Don't be that person. You won't get anywhere doing that. Murmuring does not please God. 
And we see here it doesn't please Jesus, who is God in the flesh, either. Because so much so that it warrants his attention to speak a parable of rebuke. Of rebuke. And that's what we see here. Uh, and it says here, and again, regards to the parable. And, and before we get moving forward, the parable here in this context is he's talking to the Pharisees because he, the Pharisees were upset that it says, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Okay, We'll look at the other one in Matthew 18 in just a moment. But right now he says this parable. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds it? Okay? So again, what we see here is the shepherd's concern for the one. Okay? And that's important for us to remember. When we did the series uh, one-on-one with Jesus, the intent was to understand that Jesus cares about all of us as individuals, okay? It wasn't as though Jesus and God are some ambiguous being just kind of seeing us all as a collective, right? No, he knows each and every one of us, and he cares about each and every one of us, and that's the point he's trying to make in this parable, uh, that he cares about each and every person, Okay, the scribes and the Pharisees wanted the Messiah to care only about the children of Abraham, right? But we know that through the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, we all have the, is what the Bible calls the adoption through the power and the blood of Christ to become the son of the living God. And yet here, they did not want him to do that. They, were, they would be more suited if they said, you know, you know, come tell us how good we are, right? Come tell us how righteous we are, and just how we've been doing everything right the entire time. And that's not what Jesus came to do. He says, I did not come to call the righteous, but what? Sinners to repentance is what he's come to do. And that's the point he's making in the parable. But let's understand the shepherd has concern for the one. And the heart of this parable, again, lies in the image of a shepherd, okay, leaving the 90 and 9 to search for the one lost sheep, right? It's as though he sees the multitude of his flock, but yet he knows one is missing. And it's enough to where he is willing, he is willing to walk away. And it says there in verse number four, doth not leave the ninety and nine, look at that, in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. See, he pursues until found. Isn't that good? Isn't that good that he'll pursue you until you're found? And that works in, in, in a couple of particular ways when re, in regards to that. You know, you think about someone that you might know that is lost, and lost meaning unsaved. And I think as humans and as, as just sinners uh, saved by grace, I think we look at some people and we think in our minds, unfortunately, and we say, you know what, there's no chance. There's no way. They want nothing to do with God. And you know, uh, they say, you see a lot of instances in the Bible where that's the case. But then all of a sudden, just like that, they come unto Christ because God never stops pursuing. And a lot of the things that God puts in order and puts in the lives of people are to bring, him, bring them unto him. All these circumstances that he coordinates. And a lot of times people will resist it, they will fight it, and they will try to run from it. But God will still pursue Another illustration of of God's pursuit is Jonah. A lot of times we look at the the story of Jonah or the real account of Jonah and we think about the Jonah end of the spectrum. And we think, wow, what a a rebellious, what a rotten attitude, what a a kind of person Jonah was. But really, if we look at it from the, uh, the viewpoint of God and all the things that he put in order in order to bring Jonah back, right? Isn't that amazing? And God does the same thing for each and every one of us because he is our shepherd and he cares for the one. He is our shepherd and he cares for you. He cares for you. And that's the picture he's painting there. A deep concern for the individual, all right? Uh, Highlighting that no one, let me say this, no one is insignificant to God, okay? Nobody's insignificant to God. And, and, And some people might say that. Well, God's forgotten about me. No, he hasn't. That is a lie of the devil. God will never forsake you. He will never forget you. He loves you. And and when we think about that, the investment he made in his son, Jesus Christ, shows the tremendous value he places in you as an individual. He loves you. And we see that he's got a concern. 
for the one. And we see here in verse 5, and when he hath found it, look what he does. He layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. We don't see anything about here. Uh, when he finds it, he rebukes it. He smacks it with his staff and he says, how dare you run away? How many times do I have to tell you? He doesn't do that. We'll get into that when we learn about the prodigal as well. But look at what he does. Uh, when he finds it, he layeth it on his shoulders. That's a picture of the shepherd lifting and taking the burden and carrying us back, back into the fold. You realize that, uh, you know, so many times people think if they get away from God that they've got to work their way back. That's not how any of it works. It's not that way. God is not saying, all right, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, that, uh, that kind of, you know, working your way back. It's not as though you're saying, you know, you've gotten away. Well, now you've got to re-earn it. No, there's no earning it whatsoever. It's been freely given through salvation in Jesus Christ. And we see here that, uh, you know, whether it's uh, someone that is saved and gotten away or whether it's someone that is lost and coming into the fold, in both cases, you are on the shoulders of Christ and he is now carrying you through. Isn't that amazing when we see that? And that's what he does. When he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders. And look what it says, rejoicing, rejoicing. There's no words there about it's about time. There's no words there uh, saying, well, what took you so long, right? There's no words there about any of that. It is all rejoicing. And when he cometh home, look at this. He calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying what? Saying, rejoice with me. He doesn't come and, and bring this one and say, hey, look at this. Yeah, we got the naughty one, right? Oh boy, this one. Yeah, everybody point and laugh. No, they said rejoice. We have found, right? That's why when it comes to the house of the Lord, you know, whether it be uh, somebody that comes in that maybe has never been here before, you know, we should rejoice. Welcome them into the house of the Lord, right? Uh, you know, I know sometimes people want to get sarcastic or whatever and be like, whoa, the rafters are shaking or whatever. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know how much courage it takes for some people to come into the house of the Lord? For, for, for some of us, it's real easy, right? But for some, that is a big step. Because here's the thing. It, it may not necessarily entirely be the baggage that they're carrying, but boy, the devil and his demons are doing everything they can to either stop them from coming to begin with or to prevent them from coming back. And you know what? We don't do God any favors by making a mockery, by making a joke about anybody that comes through these doors. Uh, we should have the mind of the shepherd, of anyone that comes in, all right? And, and we see that here. Uh, coming in with, uh, and rejoicing. When he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, rejoice with me, why? For I have found my sheep which was lost. And there's that word again, as we've seen in the parables, likewise. Likewise, that shows us the comparison, right? That's what brings the parable together. It says, I say unto you, likewise, joy shall be where? In heaven. Over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. You know, when it comes to salvation and people calling upon the Lord, you know, the, the angels in heaven rejoice. They rejoice. There's, there's a wonderful rejoicing going on over those that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, there should be a rejoicing when those come to know the Lord. There should be a rejoicing to those that return to the Lord. You know, it should be a wonderful opportunity for us to see that rejoicing. Now here in Luke chapter 15, it's talking more in regards to the lost because we'll get to that. Um, and when we get to the further parables, uh, when it's talking about the coin uh, in regards to the silver, or the prodigal and whatnot, but let's turn now and look at it in Matthew or Matthew chapter 18. Go back a few pages to Matthew chapter 18. And this is, it's pretty interesting when we look at that because uh, go all the way down to verse 12, Matthew 18, verse 12, when we look at it, because it's, it's, a very, it's the same parable, it has two different meanings, or two different contexts, I should say. The meaning is the same. But it says here in Matthew 18, uh, verse number 12. So actually, let's back up a few verses. Let's go back to verse 3, actually, so we can kind of transition in to see what Jesus is talking about here. Verse 3, it says, 18, Matthew 18, verse 3. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as what? Little children, right? You shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this what? Little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive su uh, one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck. And they were drowned in the depth of the sea. 
Boy, do you think Jesus loves the little children, <laughs> all the children of the world? You know, it, you know, it's good to have the heart of Jesus when you have a care for children, especially in the church. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen here, but some churches, you know, just to expect the children to act like adults when some of the adults don't even act like adults, right? Uh, you know, kids are kids, and Jesus loves children, and he says, let them come unto me. We can learn things from kids, the faith of a child. And we see here it says, verse number seven, woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs that offenses come, but woe unto that man who of offenses cometh. So he's talking about offending or stumbling the little ones. And, uh, and just what he talks about when it comes to offenses or, or getting in front of or stumbling someone's walk with Christ. Verse number eight. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter life with one eye rather than to have two, having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Take Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Okay? So again, uh, he's talking about uh, the children. He's talking about the context of, of just, uh, you know, when it comes to offenses and whatnot. And then he gets into Matthew 18, verse 12. He says, How think ye... If a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? You see the difference there? In Luke, what did he say? He said lost, right? And in uh, Matthew, he says gone astray. And in regards to Luke, he's talking about seeking and saving that which was lost, uh, calling sinners, right, unto repentance. But in this one, he's talking about those which perhaps have gone astray. Let's keep reading. And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than one of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. And then, in verse 15, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. So you see here, this one is more about restoration or more about reconciliation than it is about salvation, okay? 15 lends itself more towards salvation, uh, but in chapter Matthew chapter 18, it's more about restoration and reconciliation in regards to, unto God and to relationships. And, but both apply when it comes to sheep. You know, we must all have a burden for those that are lost, but we must all also have a burden for those that are astray, Okay. Same thing. God still cares about the one in regards to the 90 and 9, whether or not they are a sinner still in need of salvation or if they're someone that is saved and is away from the Lord. Okay, sometimes that might be the mindset. Well, they're off and they're gone. Well, I don't know what to do anymore. Well, we'll just what? Forget about No, you don't. Okay. Now, sometimes there's that pursuit. Let God pursue them. If God tells you to pursue, then pursue. But there may come a time where God says, you know what? Hold on. I'll go after them. You just be ready to receive them, right? When it comes to going and, and going and witnessing and, 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 and sharing the gospel, we know that the field is white unto harvest, but what? The laborers are few. We're to go into the harvest and, and sow the seed, but God's the one that gives the increase. God's also the shepherd that pursues after the one that has gone astray. Sometimes he asks us to go along, but sometimes he asks us to stay back. And where it says, the Bible says, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. You know, God will intervene and begin putting thorns and thistles around the path that the one that has gone astray is trying to go. And eventually, Lord willing, they will turn unto the Lord. So again, let's take a look at some application in regards to these, these two similar, they're the same parable, but told in two different contexts. Let, let, let's think about this. Uh, number one, think about a time when you felt lost or distant from God. Uh, I can give you an example for me. Uh, it was shortly, well, it was kind of right towards the end of my time at Reese Baptist Church. Um, I'll tell you, there was a time there where, uh, I mean, things were going really well. We went really well, and I think uh, I got a little zealous as a leader. We went a little too far, too fast. And there's a saying that goes like this, and I've actually used it to some of our young engineers at work. If you get too far ahead of your people you'll notice that no one is following you, okay? <laughs> and 
and that's what happened. And uh, and again, it's all on me. Got out there, pushed a little too hard, too fast, and everything fell apart. And just things weren't going well. I had gone a number of uh, months without receiving a paycheck or anything like that, just struggling. I Not only was I pastoring, but then I, I took a job with uh, Avis, driving rental cars. I was working at the rescue mission. I was working at FedEx. Uh, sometimes getting up at 2 in the morning, go to FedEx, come home, take a quick nap, go work at the rescue mission from, you know, during the day, try to prepare some messages, and then just trying to do all of that, just really, really running myself ragging. And I just remember one day sitting in the shuttle van as we were driving. What we would do with Avis is we'd go to the different airports around Michigan, and we'd drive the car from one airport to the next. We'd get on a shuttle, and they'd take us to the next one. And I remember sitting in the back of that shuttle, looking out the window, and just being like, God, where are you? And just thinking, God, you know, in my mind it was this. I was like, God, I, 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 I'm doing the right things. I'm taking the right stand. Uh, I have all the right standards. I say all the right things. I preach all the right things. God, where are you? And, you know, and I remember that time just feeling ever so distant and wondering where he was at in regards to that and just feeling that distance from there. And I remember at that moment, God says, what are you talking about? <laughs> I haven't gone anywhere, right? And I wish I could tell you right at that moment, I was like, oh, right, hallelujah, all right, now, oh, silly me. No, but it took some time. It took some time to really just, uh, just be in that situation, but God never gave up on me. You know, there was a time when I thought that I had misappropriated myself with Moses, okay? Now, mind you, Moses, as he led the people out of Egypt into the wilderness, and Moses, uh, you know, when the time came uh, that uh, when they needed water, he struck the rock, right? He struck the rock and the water came forth. And then the time went again, we're a little bit longer, they murmured again. And God says, this time don't strike the rock, speak to it. But instead, Moses gets angry and he strikes the rock a second time. And God says, I didn't tell you to do that. I told you to speak to it. And because of that, you'll never see the promised land. And, and Moses never did. He got to look at it, but he never got to enter into it. And I thought for a long time, I thought, that's me. I messed up my opportunity. God's never going to use me again. And God says, why are you making up stories? <laughs> he says, that's, that has nothing to do with you. That was with what Moses was called to. I've definitely got something for you. And through a time, six and a half years at First Baptist Church, God did a work in me. Until the time came where I received a phone call to candidate here at Harvest. Okay, And God used me in all of that time. And while he was using me, he was still growing me. But there was a time where I felt like that I had disappointed God, that I had let him down, that I had failed with my only opportunity, which none of that was true. Yes, I, I had disappointed uh, by, you know, being filled with pride and, and trying to do things my own way. But God never left me. He never forsook me. He never gave up on me. And that's the same for anyone here in this room. It does not matter. You know, God continued to pursue and he will continue to pursue you. He will not give up on you, all right? Those lies that you believe that God has given up on you are not coming from him. They're coming from the devil. Secondly, and when it comes to those things, consider those around you who might be spiritually lost or struggling. How can you embody the shepherd's attitude and actively seek to bring them back into the fold? We don't know what that looks like. It's not about uh, using your charisma or your gusto or whatever it may be. You know where you need to start is prayer. Prayer, Okay. Because here, God is the shepherd. He knows where the sheep is. He knows the situation. And he knows what can be done. Seek the Lord. Ask for his wisdom. And when he guides you, obey. But yet, it starts with a burden. It starts with a burden. Okay? We can get all encompassed with these walls right here. But you know what? That's not what God asks us to do. God asks us to be you know, thinking outside of these walls. And whatever it is he calls us to do, think about that. And then finally, uh, identify, uh, you know, sometimes uh, thinking about and having a burden for the lost. Uh, the lost. You know, I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, you know, we just had the Iowa caucuses, right? We are heading into a political season, all right? And there's going to be an attempt to divide. And that's, you got to be aware of that. And God does not want that. God wants us to maintain tender hearts with a passion for the lost, so don't get caught up in that. Now, again, do your diligence. Be right according to this. Okay, this is your guide, the Bible. Pray to the Lord, but don't allow the devil to divide or to allow you uh, to harden your heart against individuals. Remember, the battle's not against flesh and blood. 
And here's the one thing you could say to yourself. You will never look into the eyes of someone that Jesus does not love. Okay? All right? You'll never do that. Now, Jesus loves everyone. So when this time comes, continue to have a passion for the lost. Because God has a relentless love for each and every one of us, okay? And again, God will continue after us. God will continue, uh, you know, pursuing those of us no matter where we go. But aren't you glad that God never gave up on you when it came to salvation, right? He never gave up on any of us. And that should give us hope. That should give us hope, all right? Uh, And understanding that whoever it may be, that burden on your heart, whether they're lost or whether they're astray, that should give you hope to say, you know what, there is a chance. I stand before you here today. I was the one that there was no way that I was going to get saved, right? I was the one. And if I can be the one that is saved before you today, that can be anybody, all right? And, and, and that's true. So don't believe the lie of the devil. And, and, and you know, just remember that God loves you. He's never going to give up on you. He hasn't given up on you. And because of that, just let's continue to pursue after those that are lost and those that are astray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had together. Lord, I thank you that there is hope. Uh, Lord, no matter what the situation is, Lord, I thank you that uh, I thank you for your long-suffering nature towards me and not giving up on me. And Lord, that there were those who prayed for me, and those that reached out to me, those that witnessed to me. And I thank you for that. And Lord, let us carry that, that burden for others. As, as the, though the gospel was shared with us, let us share it with others as well. And Lord, with those that perhaps that may be in our lives that have gone astray, Lord, let us not give up because you have not given up. But Lord, let us continue in prayer and supplication. And Lord, use us any way that you see fit as we will rejoice when the Lamb comes home. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's get ready now for our offering. Have our usher come forward. All right, thank you, Dale. And I will just turn it over to you to pray over the offering. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be in your house to hear your words. And Lord, we pray we would draw closer to you because of, our, because of the ministry of this church, Lord, that we would be witnesses to others that are lost and in need as well. And just bless and guide us, Lord. Use these offerings for your work. Oh, forward, Lord, that the souls be saved and hearts be drawn to you. In your name we praise you and thank you, Lord. Amen. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, Be careful out there. A little bit cold, a little bit icy. Uh, Look forward to seeing everybody Sunday. Uh, we got Sunday school at 10 a.m. Looking forward to a wonderful morning service. It's followed by some baptisms as well. We're going to have a good day and Sunday night. We'll continue in 1 Samuel. Uh, I'm excited about that. In 1 Samuel, uh, they're getting ready to choose their king. And it starts off with a man chasing some donkeys. So we'll get after that. It'll be a good time Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time we've had together. Lord, I thank you that we are able to make it here safely tonight. So Lord, I ask that you get us home safely so that we can return on Sunday to continue worshiping you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.